Good morning, fellow lovers of wisdom. It is an honor to be here as your MC today because uh, we will listen to some of the few intellectual elites and scholars, the top 10% of people in this country, to talk about not to justify whether there is indeed a Filipino philosophy or not, but to render a commemorative lecture on the men and women who contributed great ideas in philosophy in this country. Only the very best people in this field will take the time and make the sacrifice to come so far for a conference like this. Imagine a world without a genius mind. That's not possible. But a world without philosophy, that's not possible. In the spirit of the worldwide celebration of philosophy day to day, teachers and philosophers throughout different topographies are gathered to listen and participate in this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity uh, to listen to those who exceeded their reputation beyond the university walls and contribute to the honing of philosophical ideas. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our afternoon panel. How was your lunch? I hope you had a sumptuous lunch. My name is Gluvedi and I am your master of ceremony and moderator this afternoon. So some announcement before we begin. At the end of panel four, a link will be provided to you for the evaluation of the program. So please tune in to your private room because the link will be sent there. Now this link will only be available for five minutes. So please take note. I would also like to remind the participants to fill in your details carefully in the evaluation form because your details will be used in your certificates. Thank you. Now, welcome to panel three. Here with us are th three speakers who will discuss and present topics in relation to the philosophical thoughts of several of our Filipino philosophers. So let me introduce our speakers. First is Dr. Mark Joseph Calano. He is an associate professor and the graduate program coordinator of the Department of Philosophy at the Ateneo de Manila University, where he served as SOH coordinator of research and creative works for three years. He is a graduate of Bachelor of Philosophy, cum laude, MA Philosophy, cum laude, MA Religious Studies, magna cum laude, PhD in Applied Linguistics, magna cum laude from St. Lee University, and a graduate of PhD in philosophy from Ateneo de Manila University. He also did a postdoctorate fellowship at the Ciencia Forum in Tübingen at the Dynamics of Religion in Southeast Asia in Berlin and Göttingen, Germany, and also at the Benedict XVI Center in Vienna, Austria. He served as the past president of the Philosophical Association of the Philippines Incorporated and was the international board member of the Korean Society for Religion and Literature. He is the professor for ancient and medieval philosophy in the Roman Catholic Archdiocesan Seminaries of Pampanga and Manila and at the Loyola School of Theology. He is also the research director for the executive MNSA program of the National Defense College. He is a chapter brother of the Order of the Most Holy Savior, the Brigantine Monks in Oregon, USA. In his normal days, he is a Plutist and an Aikidoka with a Nidan rank that is a second level black belt from Aikikai Hombo Dojo in Japan. His knowledge and practice of research is proven by about 70 plus international ISI and Scopus index and local journal articles and 10 textbooks. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Mark Joseph Calano. 
Our second speaker is Dr. Wilhelm P.J. Esterbell. Dr. Esterbell is an assistant professor and currently the chair of the Department of Philosophy of Ateneo de Manila University. He recently earned his PhD degree in May 2019 with a dissertation on Nietzsche's eternal recurrence. He has been teaching in Ateneo for 20 years now and has taught philosophy of the human person, philosophy of religion, ethics, and logic. The main inspirations that shape his teaching style are his teachers in philosophy, Father Rocky J. Ferriols, SJ, and the late Ramon C. Reyes. He lives in Marikina City with his wife and two children. Everybody that is Dr. Wilhelm P.J. Estrabel. Now for our final speaker in panel three, we have Dr. Flor de Lis Altes Albella. Dr. Altes Albella is an associate professor of the Department of Philosophy of the University of Santo Tomas, teaching in the Faculty of Arts and Letters and the Ecclesiastical Faculties. She is also a research fellow of the Center for Culture, Arts, and Humanities. She is an associate editor of both Critique, an online journal of philosophy, and she received the Silver Award from the USD Office of the Vice Rector for Research and Innovation in 2016 and the Gawad Santo Tomas de Aquino in 2012. With a research interest geared toward phenomenology, her significant publications include Phenomenologizing Organic Thought, Florendo H. Hornedo's Philosophical Anthropology in Critique, Year 2016. Next is The Body in Karol Wojtyla's Notion of Love in Siribayat, Year 2013. Next, The Corporal Epiphanies of the Good in Emmanuel Levinas ethical encounter in Critique year 2011, and last, the banal and implied forms of evil in the phenomenological ethics of Emmanuel Levinas in Critique year 2007. A wife of a historian and a mother of three, she is currently researching on what resonates her philosophical advocacy, which is the defense of marriage and family. She is also a former student of Dr. Abulad, one of the few who are privileged to have him as godfather. Ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome Dr. Flor Delis Altes Albella and all our speakers with a virtual round of applause. Now, without further ado, let me call our first speaker with the topic, Si Tomas para kay Tomas, Pagsasalin at Ambag sa Pilosopiya, Dr. Mark Joseph Calano. Maraming Sir? salamat. Maraming salamat, Ma'am Glove, uh, sa uh, napakabait at ganda mong uh, uh, pagbungad uh, pag sa amin. No? Uh, sisimulan ko na ang aking panayam at ang aking panayam ay si Tomas kay Tomas, pagsasalin at ambag sa pamimilosopiya sa Filipino. Ang, nice, ang papel na ito ay nais nice kong ialay para kay uh, Dr. Tomas Rosario. Uh, isa siyang uh, uh, kag kasama namin sa kagawaran ng pilosopiya sa pamantasang Ateneo de Manila at kilala siya para sa kanyang contribution sa pagsasalin sa mga obra ni Santo Tomas uh, sa wikang Filipino. Ang balangkas ng aking panayam ay binubuo ng tatlong bahagi. Ang unang bahagi ay pilosopiya bilang pagsasalin, uh, ang gawain ng pilosopiya bilang trabaho ng pagsasalin, pagsasalin bilang pagbigkas sa totoo, on ng totoo, at ang pagbigkas sa totoo at si Santo Tomas. Sa pamamagitan ng balangkas na ito, aking susubukang palawigin ang ating pag-uunawa sa proyekto ni Tomas Rosario at gaya na rin ng kanyang pag-uunawa sa pilosopiya at kung saan ito nakakagat. Simulan natin. Uh, 
Ang buong gawain ng filosofiya ay gawain ng pagsasalin. Isang gawain ng pagpapasa. Isang gawain ng pasa-pasa. Kung baga, sinasalin. Ang panayam na ito ay testimonya niyan. May tila natural na proseso na kung saan maaring maaninag sa pagnanais ng ina na matuto ang kanyang anak o kaya ng isang guro na may matutunan yung kanyang estudyante. Isang uri ng pagpapasa o kaya naman ay pagsasalin. Hindi ba't ang ating kasaysayan, pati na rin ang ating pag-unawa sa pilosopiya, ay mulat sa patuloy na pagtatalaban ng kung ano yung naisasalin at kung ano yung hindi naisasalin. Gaya ng sabi ko, ang buong kwento ng pilosopiya ay kwento ng pagsasalin. Hindi ba't isinalin ni Platon si Socrates o kaya ni Aristoteles ang mga sinaunang Griego? Hindi ba isinalin rin ni San Agustin si Platon o kaya ni Santo Tomas si Aristoteles? Gayun din ang ginawa ng mga disipulo ni Nalauzi at Kongzi. Isang uri ng pagpapasa, isang uri ng pagsasalin. Kung kaya't ang pag-unawa natin ng pilosopiya ay hindi maaaring objetibo lamang sapagkat ang bawat kwento ng pilosopiya o pagbasa sa pilosopiya o kaya paglapit sa teksto ay batay sa isang pamayanang kinakaugatan. Ibig sabihin ni kailan hindi natin binasa ang isang teksto na hiwalay sa isang pamayanang nagturo sa atin kung ano yung kailangang bigyang diin, bigyang halaga. Sa makatwid, ang pilosopiya o gawain ng pilosopiya ay isang gawain ng pagsasalin. May tradisyon sa bawat pamimilosopiya. Hindi basta-basta maaring ipagdikit ang isang uh, pilosopong uh, taga-Europa sa isang pilosopong taga-Amerika, halimbawa. At hindi ito may hiwalay sa pamayanan ng mga namimilosopiya. Kung kaya't bilang guro ng pamantasang Ateneo din Manila no? at mag-aaral sa Universidad ng Santo Tomas, maaring unawain ang proyekto ni Tomas Rosario bilang pagkagat sa tradisyon ng dalawang pamantasang ito. Hindi maaaring ihiwalay ang proyekto ni TR, yun ang tawag namin sa kanya, sa buong proyekto ng pagtuturo ng pilosopiya sa wikang Filipino na pinasimulan ni Padre Roque Ferriols. At gayon din naman ang kanyang walang pagod na pagnanais na unawain sa wika natin ang pilosopiya ni Santo Tomas. Yan rin ay nakakagat sa pamantasang Universidad uh, ng Santo Tomas. Gayun din ang ginagawa ng pilosopiya. Isang pakikisangkot sa totoo habang nakakagat sa nibel ng konteksto ng tradisyon ng wika. Ibig sabihin, may pag-uunawa na ang pilosopiya ay interesado sa totoo. Ngunit ang paglapit natin sa totoo ay hindi maaaring ihiwalay sa ating pinagmulan. Sa makatwid, sa pag-aaral ng pilosopiya, hindi ito objetibo na parang objeto ng siyensya uh, porket alam mo na, eh, alam mo na. Hindi ganyan ang kilos ng pilosopiya. Parating may kasamang sarili sa bawat pag-alam, sa bawat pagkilala ng teksto, sinasama natin ang ating pinagmulan. Kung kaya't parating may paghuhusga 
parating may pakikipagtalaban, parating may pagkamulat, parating may pagkagising. Hindi maaari na ang pagbasa mo sa teksto halimbawa ni Aristoteles o kaya ni Santo Tomas ay parating ganun na lamang. Laging may bago sapagkat may nagbabago at yan ay yaong nagbabasa ng teksto. Dito natin makikita kung bakit mahalaga ang pagkilos ng pagsasalin sapagkat ang pagsasalin ay isang uri ng pagbigkas sa totoo. No? Hindi may pagkakaila na kapag sinabi mo na ang ginawa mo lamang ay nagsalin, para bang titignan ka ng tao at sasabihin sa'yo, yun lang ang ginawa mo, para ka na rin walang ginawa. Na parang ang kilos ng pagsasalin ay isang pag-uulit lamang. Na parang ang kilos ng pagsasalin ay hindi maaring maging original. Ngunit may mga salita sa Filipino na hindi mo masasabi sa Latin. Gaya ng may mga salita sa Latin na hindi mo masasabi sa Filipino. Dito makikita mo o matatauhan ka uh, na ang ginagawa ng pagsasalin ay isang uri ng pagdadagdag at isang uri ng uh, pagbabawas. No? Ibig bang sabihin na walang totoo? Uh, hindi. Uh, Hingi lang ako ng 30 minutes kasi nag-notify yung, yung wifi ko na mamamatay na ako hindi ko isasaksak yung aking laptop at isasaksak ko na siya ngayon. Paumanhin. So, ibig sabihin, may mga salita tayo na meron sa Filipino na wala sa Latin. At meron ding mga salita sa Latin na wala sa Filipino. At anong ibig sabihin yan? Ibig sabihin yan na bawat kilos ng pagsasalin ay nangangahulugang merong dinadagdag na pananaw yung nagsasalin sa sinasalin na teksto. Ngunit sapagkat hindi eksakto yung salitang kanyang pinipili, ay meron din siyang pagbabawas na kinakailangang gawin sa bawat teksto ang kanyang sinasalin. Isang pagdadagdag, isang pagbabawas. Ngunit kung ano yung idinadagdag at kung ano yung ibinabawas ay desisyong ginagawa at pinipili ng taong nagsasalin. Ganyan ang ginawa ni TR sa kanyang desisyong isalin ang mga bahagi ng Suma Theologiae. Kinakailangan niyang piliin ang mga salita. Kinakailangan niyang pagdesisyonan. Ano nga ba ang pinakamalapit na salita upang bigkasin halimbawa ang Actus Humanus o kaya ang Actus Homini? Paano niya napagdesisyonan na ang isa ay tatawagin niyang kilos sa kilos ng tao at yung pangalawa naman ay kilos tao? Halimbawa, isang desisyon. Ibig sabihin, yung taong nagsasalin ay laging nagdidesisyon kung ano ang pinakaakma. Sa pagdidesisyon ito, ibig bang sabihin na walang totoo? Hindi. Ang totoo ay nananatiling totoo kahit na ano pang mangyari. Maaaring makita ang katotohanan gamit ang anong wika. Ngunit kinakailangan nating tanggapin na habang ang totoo ay maaaring danasin gamit ang anong wika, may kaunting nagbabago sa pagdanas ng totoo dahil na rin sa abot-tanaw ng wika. Kapag iniintindi natin ang isang bagay, yung totoo, sa abot-tanaw ng ating wika, hinihigitan nito ang nibel ng konsepto at hinahayaan natin ang ating mga sariling tikman ito sa ating punto de vista. Para ba niyang spaghetti? No? Maaari namang intindihin ang spaghetti 
sa punto de vista ng mga Italyano, ngunit pwede ring lapitan ang pag-uunawa at pagdanas ng spaghetti sa pagkain ng Pilipinong spaghetti. Matamis-tamis, may hotdog, at may ketchup. Ibig sabihin, nagbabago ang pagdanas ng totoo kapag inapag dinanas natin ito sa abot tanaw ng wika. Sa paggamit ng wikang Filipino, binubuksan natin ang ating kamalayan sa katotohanan kayang bigkasin ng ating wika. Sabay rin nating natutuklasan ang mga aspeto ng totoo na hindi nito kayang bigkasin. Ibig sabihin, ang totoo ay humihigit sa konsepto. Ang totoo nagkakamukha para sa atin. At gaya ng sabi ko, hindi konsepto ang pinag-uusapan natin rito. Hindi ideya lamang, hindi isang abstraksyo kung hindi ay ang konkretong pagdanas ng talagang totoo. No? Isang pagmumulat sa talagang totoo, isang paggising sa tunay. Na alam ko na yung binibigkas ko ay hindi isang produkto ng pagmumuni lamang, kundi isang pakikipagtagpo. Isang tunay na pagtikim sa talagang totoo. At malaki yung pagkakaiba nun. Hindi tayo nagsasalin upang patunayan na may kakayahan din ang ating wika na nabigkasin ang nabigkas na. No? Napaka postkolonyal ng proyektong yan. Napaka reactionary. Bagkus, nagsasalin tayo upang makatagpurin natin ang talagang totoo sa abot tanaw ng ating pagdanas sa mundo. Sa pamamagitan ng wika, dito mauunawa ng kilos ng pagsasalin bilang pag-angkin sa totoo, pagtanggap sa tunay na nadadanas, pagbigkas sa karanasan. Isang paglapit sa pagdanas ng totoo, isang pagbigkas sa talagang totoo. At hindi ito ganun na lamang kadali. Dito, hindi mahalaga kung sino ang nagsabi. No? Sabi ni Padre Roque, kung, sabi daw ni Santa Teresa de Avila, kung ang demonyo nagsabi ng totoo, maniniwala ako, hindi sapagkat demonyo yung nagsabi, kundi sapagkat totoo yung sinabi. Bagkus ang tamang sa tanong ay, totoo ba? Tunay ba? Natatalaban ba ako? Nadadanas ko ba yung kanyang sinasabi? O isang ideya lamang yan, isang konsepto lamang yan, walang kagat sa totoo, di ba? Sapat na ba upang naising makipagtagpo sa totoo upang maging pilosopo, palaisip? Hindi rin, no? Kinakailangan ang isang uri ng pagtataya ng sarili, hindi lamang sa pilosopiya, kung hindi ay pati na rin sa mga taong sangkot rito. Hindi ka maaaring maging guro na tapat lamang sa pilosopiya. Kailangan naramdam mo rin yung responsibilidad na gisingin ang mga mag-aaral sa kanilang talino at kamulatan sa posibilidad na danasin ang totoo. Tapat, hindi lamang sa pilosopiya, kung hindi sa pamayanan na kasama sa pamilosopiya. Ang ugnayan ko kay TR ay sapagkat mentor, mentee yung aming ugnayan. No? Naging mentor ko si TR at habang nagsisimula ako uh, sa Ateneo, ay siya yung talagang nagturo sa akin sa pamamaraan ng paggawa. No? Uh, hindi masyadong nakikiusap uh, si TR sa kahit na sino. Meron siyang dedikasyon sa kanyang ginagawa. Uh, at kadalasan nakakulong lamang siya sa kanyang uh, opisina. Ngunit alam mo rin 
na paminsan yayayain ka niya para kumain sa labas at pag-usapan kung ano na yung nangyayari sa'yo. Isang, sa tingin ko, tapat na pagpapahayag ng pakikisangkot, hindi lamang sa kanyang ginagawa, kundi sa iyo rin. Sa loob ng kanyang buhay pagsasalin, inilapit ni Tomas Rosario si Santo Tomas sa ating mga Filipino. Binigyan niya tayo ng bokabularyo upang makita rin ang mga natanaw at nadanas ni Santo Tomas sa punto de vista ng ating wika. Tandaan nyo, mula sa original na Latin, isinalin ni T.R. ang ilang mga tanong mula sa Suma Theologiae sa wikang Filipino. At hindi iyon ganun kadali. Bago ang kanyang hindi inaasahang pagkakasakit, at pagkamatay, naisalin na ni T.R. ang kwestyo, u- ang unang tanong hanggang ikalabing pitong tanong ng Suma Theologiae, ng Prima Pars. Uh, hiwalay pa rito ang kanyang masusing pagpili ng mga mahalagang kwestyo ukol sa etika mula sa Prima Secunde na nailathala na ng UST Press. Nice kung magpakita ng mga salin ni TR sa inyo. Baka isipin nyo na linoloko ko lang kayo o kaya nagpapanggap lamang ako. Ito ay pitong libro na isinalin ni TR. Man ako ito kay TR, binigay niya sa akin. At makikita nyo ng isang librong ganitong kakapal ay tanong uh, labing anim at labing pito lamang ng Suma Theologiae. At ganun pa yung kanyang mga sumusunod na mga akda, uh, labing apat hanggang labing lima, at yung mga sumusunod pa. Uh, sa USD Press, uh, sinalin nila yung kanyang buong, ay i- i- nilathala nila yung kanyang buong libro sa etika ni Santo Tomas, na kung saan pinag-usapan niya ang kaligayahan, eudaimonia, o kaya uh, 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 kaligayahan, yung kilos tao, kilos loob at kilos laabas, konsyensya, uh, mga hadlang sa paggawa ng desisyon, at iba-iba pa. Uh, uh, wala akong kopya ng librong yan sapagkat nasa Ateneo at bawal kami pumunta sa Ateneo uh, kung kaya't hindi ko may papakita yung librong yan. Ngunit kulay pula ang pabalat ng librong iyan. Sa pamamagitan ng pagsasalin niya sa Pilipino, sa mga mahalagang pinag-usapan ni Santo Tomas, binigyan tayo ni TR ng bokabularyo upang pag-usapan rin yung nadanas ni Santo Tomas. Bagkus, binibigyan niya tayo ng pagkakataong ihabi ang ating mga sarili sa teksto ni Santo Tomas. Ngunit hindi may higit pa, no? Tandaan nyo, upang isalin si Santo Tomas, kinakailangan na pumasok sa kamalayan uh, ni Santo Tomas. Hindi sapat na alam mo na ang Latin. Kinakailangan na alam mo rin ang pinagmulan ng kanyang pag-uunawa. At hindi yan madali. Paano pa ang ilapit siya sa wikang Filipino? Ibig sabihin, sa taong nagsasalin, pumapasok ka sa mundo ng taong yung sinasalin, sabay dinadala mo rin siya sa mundo mo at sinusubukan mong pag-usapan ang kanyang pagdanas ng totoo. Kakaibang gawain. Ang magsalin ay dibiro. Sa isang banda, kinakailangan mong maging mapagpakumbaba sapagkat hindi naman sa iyo ang original na sinalin. Isang pagtuklas lamang ng katapat ang iyong ginagawa. Ito sa tingin ko ay isang uri ng disiplina o disposition, isang uri ng pagkamatay sa sarili, kenosis, upang mapanatiling tapat sa sinasalin. Sa isang banda, Bilang isang nag-aral rin ng pilosopiya, siguradong sigurado ako na gusto ring sabihin ni Tomas na malika Tomas. 
Ngunit sa kanyang posisyon bilang tagasalin, merong pagpapakumbaba roon. Marahil nagtatanong na kayo kung ano ang tungkol kay TR sa panayam na to. Tahimik na mentor si TR. Bugnutin pa nga paminsan o kadalasan, pero sa ilalim ng tila malakas nitong personalidad ay isang tao na patuloy dinidisiplina ang sarili sa kilos o gawain ng pagsasalin. Sa tingin ko, gaya ng hindi na natin makikilala si Emma Crawford o Joan Stambo o Mark Raftery Skihan, may pagsasanay ukol sa kamatayan rin ang gawain ng pagsasalin. Si Emma Crawford ang tagasalin ang nagsali ng Home of Yator ni Gabriel Marcel. Si Joan Stanbo ang pinakasikat na nagsalin ng uh, Being and Time or Zine und Zeit ni Martin Heidegger. Uh, si Mark Rafter Iskihan naman ay kasamahan namin sa kagawaran ng filosofiya, ngunit isinalin niya ay kasama siya sa grupo na nagsalin ng cosmopolitanismo ni Jacques Derrida. Pero hindi natin kilala yung mga tagasalin. Dumabasa at nagbabasa tayo ng mga teksto ng mga pilosopo sa wikang Ingles. Kilala natin yung nagsulat, pero kadalasan hindi pinapansin yung nagsalin. Subalit sa kamay ng mga tagasalin, gaya ng sa kamay ni TR, ang mismong pagsasalin ay original na rin. Kung tutuusin, hindi mo naman laging idinidikit ang salin sa isinalin upang ito ay maunawaan. Kung ganon, di lang, edi wag ka nalang magsalin, bumalik ka nalang sa original kung hindi mo naman kayang basahin yung isinalin na hiwalay sa, is, sa sinalin. Sa ayaw mo o sa hindi, kinakailangang may kakayahang tumayo sa kanilang mga sariling paa ang mga bagong salin habang sabay na tumatanaw ng utang loob sa pinagmulang akda. Ang isinalin ni TR ay kayang tumayo ng hiwalay sa Latin na suma. At dahil riyan, original rin. Kaya dapat na si TR ay tanawin rin bilang haligi ng pimilosopiya sa Pilipinas. Hindi sapagkat siya ay nagsalin lamang, ngunit sapagkat ang kanyang pagsasalin ay original pa rin. Kung totoo ang wika ni Alfred North Whitehead na ang lahat raw ng pilosopiya ay pagpapalawig lamang sa binigkas ni Platon, maaring tignan ang gawain ng pilosopiya bilang pagsasalin. Ngunit kung titignan ang lahat ng saling lahi, matatauhan tayo na bawat isa ay may pagsasalin rin. Bawat salin ay nananatiling bago pa rin. May salitang ginamit riyan si Gabriel Marcel, Nostos at Kainonti. Luma at bago pa rin. Sa tingin ko, ang bawat pagsasalin ay luma ngunit sabay na bago pa rin. Hindi ko pag-uusapan ang mga desisyong ginawa ni TR sa kanyang mga akda. Sapagkat sa tingin ko, ang desisyong magsalin para kay TR ay ang kanyang ambag sa pilosopiya. Sa pilosopag-iisip at pamimilosopiya sa wikang Filipino. Hindi ito mahalaga para lamang sa mga nag-aaral sa pagkapari, kundi mahalaga ito sa pag-unawa natin sa pagbigkas at pagdanas ng totoo. Isang pagpapalawig sa wika, isang pagkagat sa wika. 
Ngunit ang pilosopiya ay ganyan nga. Gaya ng ang isang pintor na nabighani sa bukang liwayway ay nagpipinta. O ang isang makata na nakakita ng binibining maganda ay tumutula. O ang kompositor na natinag sa mga taludtod ng makata ay lumilikha ng kanta. Ang gumagawa ng pilosopiya ay nagsasalin rin. At ang bawat pagsalin ay pagbikas ng totoo. Diyan nagtatapos ang aking panayam. Uh, maraming salamat po. So, uh, ano na po ang susunod kong gagawin? Uh, ipapasa ko na po ang uh, susunod sa susunod. Tama, sir? Ako ba ang nawala? Hello. Hello. Boss, ikaw na. Hi, Mark. Mukhang nawawala yung ating host. Oo nga eh. Um, Hinihintay ko rin lang yung aking cue. Uh, since naipasok ka na sa tingin ko, ikaw na ang susunod. Kailangan lang nila eh. akong alisin para <laughs> makapagbigay ka rin ng panayam mo. Uh, Sige. Mukha siguro nagkakaroon tayo ng ilang mga technical na problema siguro. Ano? Ah, baka ito na, babalik na po si Ma'am. Hello, Mang Glove. Yes, hello po. Ayan. Now, let us welcome. Thank you, Sir Mark. Now, let us welcome our second speaker, Dr. Dr. Wilhelm P.J. Esterbel. Sir. Thank you, Mang Glove. First, I'd like to thank, of course, PNUSL and PNPRS for uh, inviting me here, especially uh, Dr. Abenes for uh, personally asking me to be here. Um, so let me just share my slide. I've been asked to talk about Dr. Ramon Reyes. Six years since he passed, the legacy of Ramon Castillo Reyes continues. Ask any of his students, and three major themes will emerge regarding his contribution to philosophy in the Philippines. History, existential phenomenology, and most especially, ethics. Dr. Aguas brought up this morning the continuing dialogue among us regarding the status of Filipino philosophy and the status of our forerunners within, the, within that dialogue. Dr. De Leon brought attention to Dr. Reyes' scathing remarks to Father Mercado's work. Of course, I shall not try to answer to that because I am sure that uh, Father Mercado and uh, Dr. Reyes are probably shaking hands in a different state of being as we are still here going through uh, our very own lives. But using the lens of history, we do not notice that these questions actually suffer a very modern attitude regarding the relationship between philosophers and their philosophy. I'd like to bring your attention to a quote that uh, is often heard from Dr. Reyes himself uh, towards the end of his uh, modern philosophy class. After talking about David Hume and his philosophy, Doc Reyes quotes uh, Hume to say, be a philosopher, but also be a person. Of course, I took the liberty of editing Hume's words in deference to Dr. Pasricha, um, 
So I hope the paraphrase is forgiven. Be a philosopher, but also be a person. Perhaps that's a better way of rendering it, even if, of course, the original is also in English. But back to the point. In Hellenistic times, that forgotten era of the history of the West between the crumbling of Alexander's empire and the success of Christianity in Constantine's Rome, okay, I'm referring to the flourishing of the Socratic schools of the Stoics, the Cynics, the Epicureans, the Platonists and Neoplatonists, and the Peripatetics. Philosophy was a way of life. And the philosophers were exemplars of their own ideas. Of course, Diogenes Laertius himself was not a philosopher. Okay? He is a doxographer. We somehow got that word, I believe, from Hermann Diels, that uh, German scholar who gave us the translation and also the way of putting together all of those fragments from the ancient Greeks, especially the pre-Socratics. Okay? He's a doxographer. His work composed of not just what the philosophers thought, but also how they lived their lives. So he wrote uh, Diogenes Laertius, of course, not to be confused with Diogenes Sinope, who was himself a, a cynic and a philosopher. So Diogenes Laertius wrote the doxographies. And perhaps you remember that doxa is the Greek word for opinion. So doxographies bring together the lives, the opinions, and the theories of the philosophers. That work from Diogenes Laertius is a testimony of that. For it was the main insight of the Socratic schools that philosophy is sought for the sake of the good life. And so I'll begin with something similar to that. Okay, don't worry, I'm not giving you Doc Reyes's biography. But I will simply refer to some snippets of how I knew him as a person. Back when Doc Reyes was still alive, he would often invite the entire Ateneo Department of Philosophy on the occasion of his birthday to his house. Everyone used, used to look forward to this event for a night of food, laughter, storytelling, and music. At some point in the evening of these gatherings, Doc Reyes would be cajoled to sit on his piano to regal us with jazz music and old standards played by ear and improvised with much wit. The department continues to come together with the Reyes family for a mass every year on his birthday. And we were still able to do that via video conferencing this year. It's a pity that I do not have a picture of Doc Reyes teaching in class. Uh, so. This is not Doc Reyes on my slide over here. But this is definitely his own writing on the blackboard. The soul seeking good, I believe. So perhaps students of Doc Reyes recognize this handwriting, for it also appears on the new edition of his book, The Ground and Norm of Morality. Doc Reyes was one of my two favorite philosophy teachers when I was an Ateneo College student in the late 90s. He is the best of old school teaching as it could get. All he needed was blackboard and chalk. He would stare at the chalk he caresses with his fingers as he stresses a particular point. He would wave his arms around to gather the class around the central problematic of the discussion. He would scribble word for the rest of the lecture. When the bell rings, the blackboard looks like a mind map blown to bits, abstracted, put together, dismantled, yet making absolute sense. Thus, you leave the classroom with a clear understanding of what happened in the past hour. He leaves the classroom like a painter or a miner, with hands and trousers made white with all the chalk that he worked with. His modern philosophy class covered only four topics, the scientific revolution, René Descartes, David Hume, and Immanuel Kant. But you come out of it with a deep understanding of all four and how they actually tie together. When I started teaching in 1999, I told myself that I must teach as clearly as Doc Reyes. 
He continued to be a great mentor in the lunch hours he used to share with younger faculty. He had a laugh that fills the room with the joy of being alive. And of course, the legacy of Doc Reyes continues in the memorial lectures that, that Ateneo continues to sponsor with the Reyes family. On my slide here is the poster of the most recent one held earlier this year, pre-pandemic in February. So as, as a testimony to how Doc Reyes was a teacher, fellow teachers that he guided through their own uh, college years continue to somehow pass the torch. So I'd like now to take a look at some notes, okay, the doxographical notes. First would be on history, because I'm sure that uh, most of us are familiar with that text by Doc Reyes, Man in Historical Action. And I've already made a reference to his history of Western philosophy. Doc Reyes helped AB and MA philosophy students, including priests studying philosophy, to serve their formation houses so that they would arrive at a firm and deep grasp of historical consciousness and the history of Western philosophy. That's the title of my own presentation is indeed a uh, reference to that uh, text, Man in Historical Action, which must be familiar to most of us because that's in the well-used book by uh, Dr. Manuel B.D. Jr., Philosophy of Man's Selected Readings. So I've even featured here on this slide, I believe this is a, a picture of the Department of Philosophy of Ateneo in Tagaytay during one of its planning sessions a long, long time ago. And here you have, uh, if you can see my pointer, Doc Reyes is the one on the left and Dr. D is the one on the right. If you will go back to the essay, Man in Historical Action, the main insight of Doc Reyes there is each human person is both destiny and task. And he talked about in that essay the physical, the interpersonal, the social, the historical, and the existential sense of being a cross point. And he highlights in that text, the call of the absolute. I'd like to offer in this um, sharing an insight as to perhaps this whole point in that essay is indeed connected to Doc Reyes's own historicity. For I believe he was really speaking from his life experiences. And I believe this is a well-known story to many of his students that Doc Reyes actually had a certain Kierkegaard moment because he almost got married to his, of course, he, he finally uh, married Tita Nena, but he actually didn't appear on his wedding day. And when he was asked about it, his answer was, it's because of the sense of the absolute, of tying oneself to someone forever. Somehow he felt, you know, the existential, the historical, the social, and all of the other implications of such a decision. So you could compare it, I guess, to the well-known story of Kierkegaard almost marrying Regine Olsen and backing out. But of course, the difference of the story is that uh, Kierkegaard remained a bachelor, while uh, Doc Reyes um, asked Tita Nena back, and so uh, indeed they uh, were happily married. But what I'd like to say is, this whole idea of the call of the absolute is not just something that's abstract for Doc Reyes because it came from a lived experience. That's why in this talk, I'm trying to tie together the insights of the man together with his own experiences from which those insights are drawn. But at the same time, the insight also allows such a person to live one's own life. But this realization about the absolute perhaps became the decision or well, that's, that's where the decision uh, to be absent on his wedding day came from. But it was also the same insight that brought him back and, and uh, eventually went through with the wedding. Now, a doxographical note on phenomenology. Well, alongside Father Jose A. Cruz and uh, Father Roque Ferriols, 
Doc Reyes also is credited for introducing existential phenomenology as a way of doing philosophy in Ateneo. If Ateneo philosophy is known for the existential phenomenological tradition, Doc Reyes, as he was honorably called, is one of the pillars of this tradition. And the doxographical note that I'd like to make would be, is, uh, would be this. If the banner of phenomenology is that philosophy must be grounded in, move within, and impinge upon human lived experience, somehow all of these um, insights, why this is important to Doc Reyes is also seen in the way that he goes through all of his mundane tasks according to uh, the testimony of his own children. Doc Reyes, uh, I've heard stories and he actually told these stories himself, uh, used to be the one to change the oil of his own car. And his son would tell the story of how Doc Reyes would often, or every year, would be the one who would go up the roof of their house to make sure that the roof won't be leaking during the typhoon season. He was also the one who would um, trim the trees around their house. So to his children, Doc Reyes went through all of these mundane tasks. And I would believe that his act of philosophizing cannot be separated from these mundane tasks. That the grounding of philosophy is life experience and our life experience is also enriched by doing phenomenology particularly and I guess uh, philosophy in general. And lastly, a doxographical note on ethics, for of course, Doc Reyes is most known for being a teacher of ethics and also uh, for his book that's well used as a textbook for college students in ethics, The Ground and Norm of Morality. The book, The Ground and Norm of Morality, first came out in 1989. The said, the said textbook is indeed a standard textbook for, for uh many college students, but also, I believe, for seminarians who are taking philosophy. In the Ateneo de Manila, where philosophy is offered as part of the core curriculum, meaning every student's program of study includes philosophy, regardless of what their course or their concentration is, uh, Doc Reyes is known by alumni as a teacher of the core course entitled Ethics. Towards the end of his life, Doc Reyes gave us a, perhaps this is the last thing I remember from one of his later sharings with us, and perhaps this is something that in, indeed he said during the launching of his own festschrift, the Moral Dimension Essays in honor of Ramon Castillo Reyes. When he was asked in, in his acceptance of what he thinks you know, morality is all about, again, here we see the grounding of his insights with his own experience as a person, he would refer back to, to his own experience as a little child and remember his elders always reminding him to teach him about perhaps uh, ethics, morality, or shall we say, according to the ancient Greeks, the good life. Hindi maganda yan tignan. Now, if you want to demonstrate to a child that this is the wrong thing to do, so as to introduce to the child what the right thing to do is, he notices that, perhaps aside from the fact that this is um, a personal experience, but also it is perhaps linguistic and cultural in nature, that we Filipinos have a sense of the ethical by way of the aesthetic. When we say, hindi yan maganda tignan, hindi maganda sa mata. The appeal of ethics to the Filipino is something that is rather aesthetic, that we see a very big connection between what is good and what is beautiful. And thus, towards the end of his life, uh, Doc Reyes has left this insight with us that in the end, perhaps we may learn all of these theories, perhaps we may go over through all of the nitty-gritty of all of the theories, of course, not to discount them, for indeed, uh, going through all of these ideas is very important for our own erudition and, of course, for our own edification. But there has to be that sense of a bigger picture, that sense of something greater. That if ethics is not grounded in what is beautiful, then maybe this just remains something rather conceptual and even separate from actual lived experience. 
And so let me just wrap up, for I believe I only have two minutes left. The presentation sought to tie together these different strands of ethics, existential phenomenology, and historical consciousness by connecting it to Doc Reyes's profound insight towards the end of his life that doing ethics must also be within the greater scheme of aesthetics. In the tradition of Hellenistic doxography, the life of the man himself leads us to a better appreciation of his philosophical insights. Aside from giving us a better appreciation of Doc Reyes's concept of the cross point, this leaves us the challenge to do the same. In this way, philosophy avoids the perennial danger of disengaging from the world it seeks to understand, and we return to the Socratic idea that philosophy is not just a discipline in logical conundra, but it is a life-affirming attitude. And thus, if philosophy begins in wonder, it doesn't stop there. The philosophy is living out that wonder for as uh, the doxographers like the Diogenes Laertius would say, the philosopher is what he does. Thank you. And uh, I now return to our host, Mam Glove. Thank you, Dr. Strobel, for the presentation. Please stand by for the Q&A after the third speaker. Now for our third and final speaker to share about Filipinos doing philosophy in the lens of Romualdo Abulad, let us all welcome Dr. Flor Delis Altes Albella. Ma'am. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. So without further ado, let me share my screen. Okay, there you go. So I am tasked to pay tribute to a beloved professor Romualdo E. Avulad. And for that, the title of my paper is Filipinas Doing Philosophy in the Lens of Romualdo Avulad. This essay ventures to what could be a very awkward area in Romualdo E. Avulad's philosophical positions. This pertains to a question that I never dared ask brother Romy, but would hear others ask him anyway. And this is about Filipino philosophy on whether it exists and what it consists. For numerous times, I have heard and read him address this issue despite his insistence that the point is already out of the question. The exasperation in the matter is very obvious when read and most especially when heard. The irony of it all is that even if he does not buy the idea that we already have formed some sort of a national philosophy, say, Filipino philosophy as aligned with Greek, German, French, Chinese philosophies. Abulad have said a lot about how Filipinos have done philosophy within the context of history, culture, and the emerging philosophical activities in our country. And this tribute to him on the day after UNESCO's World Philosophy Day, I dare myself to show my beloved professor, Romualdo E. Abulad's take on Filipino philosophy and how it evolved from a critical resistance to intellectual indigenization towards an open dialogue on how Filipinos might be in the process of gradually developing one by actually doing philosophy according to the scholarly demands of one's philosophical interest. This is never an easy task, which should take a lot of courage because we can no longer solicit his affirmation or correction, as how I always ask for it when he was still alive, that there might even be possibility of putting words into his mouth. As my senior, Dr. Paolo Bolaño said, well, it is not impossible. It is difficult to reconstruct Abulad's intellectual contribution and that it is ill-advised to look for what does not exist. And so I am left with the scholarly option to consult his writings in order to weave a consistent narrative, which hopefully would give justice to his almost five decades of effort. I contend the serious importance of knowing the status of philosophy in the lens of Abulad because his reflections may gauge our efforts according to the proper barometers of philosophical scholarship, historical consciousness, and postmodern openness. And so my paper will be of three parts. First, I will describe Abulad's rhetoric, which molds his standards on what should be considered as philosophical. Second, 
I shall present a narrative on how his writings can reveal a transition of his position and attitude towards the status of Filipino philosophy. And lastly, I shall present what I hope is a prudent estimate on how he sees the promise of philosophical discipline in the Philippines. And so, let's begin. Abulad's rhetoric. Abulad's philosophical tenor is reflected by the elements that are consistently present in his essays, critique and historical consciousness. His critique is remarkably Kantian as he is meticulous about categorizing his ideas, cognizant of form of content, and would evaluate the same thoughts while citing pure reason should always be at work. This is something that he was able to explain well in the 1981 essay, Si Kant at Ang Filosofia sa Pilipinas. Ang hinihiling lamang ng kritisismo ay ang palagi ang pagsubaybay natin sa mga suhitibong hangganan ng ating mga hatol. Para sa pilosopiya, ito ay nangangahulugan na ang bawat isa ay may kalayaang gamitin ang wagas na katwiran kahit na ito ay lampas sa nahahayon ng karanasang empirikal. Ngunit sa kondisyon na hindi natin ibabandila ang ating mga hatol sa isang dogmatikong pamamaraan. Unquote. It is in that way where Abulad poured everything into his scholarship even to the point of transgressing well-guarded philosophical tenets in order to find truth even in little things. For him, that is an affirmation of how freedom is truly a prerequisite of reason. He couples this relentless critique by carefully taking into account every historical context that may enrich the meaning of his points. He is ever grounded with the fundamentals of Eastern and Western thoughts from ancient to contemporary period that he takes time to tackle the proper historical context of the theme and then proceed to put it in dialogue with other philosophies to compare, synthesize, or show a bigger perspective. Every student of Abulad will have to agree that his discussion on any scene will contain a petty narrative of the history of Eastern or Western philosophical tradition, that a proponent of each philosophical period will have to be mentioned at least once in the essay, probably for an attempt of creating a contextual timeline or of putting these philosophies in dialogue with an ever-timely and timeless issue. In a casual conversation when I asked about why such discursive attitude, I remember him reminding me about the need for mastery, that one can only excel in philosophy when capable of going around and about the topic, considering all thinkable perspectives and leaving no point unturned. This reflected so well when he marked our exam booklets. Um, I, I feel sorry for not finding my test booklets, but um, I remember them so vividly. From college to graduate school, in our essays, he expected meticulous details, which never meant to write longer paragraphs. What he needed from us is to put the important elements together in the most comprehensive scheme. In our papers, we have found him encircling errors, checking the key points, and annotating follow-up questions. Same requirement applied to every term paper. Just add a well-plotted outline, correct citation, and comprehensive bibliography. To be a student of Dr. Abulad means, mean, means to be trans to a scholarly training where we were convinced to prioritize the primary source, to read, highlight, and annotate, that is to make the book dirty, and write a detailed outline of what we have read. Why would we, why would he not win us over, right? He reads to us the real books and at, in real German form, Kant and Wittgenstein in my case, aloud with feelings and in full energy. It is from such careful study where the mind is prepared to express something new. In the 1988 essay, Contemporary Filipino Philosophy, he writes that originality emerges from intellectual thoroughness which in turn is a result of a long and patient training and experience. In other words, what one may contribute should always be a product of a tedious effort, as the highest and the brightest stars are born out of cosmic conflict. And true to his form, he went on quoting Plato. Philosophy does not at all admit of verbal communion, communion therewith. It is kindled by a leaping spark and thereafter nourishes itself. The second part of the paper is entitled, Uso pa ba ang Pilisopiyang Pilipino? A problem that he would always address. Abulad's strict requirement of scholarly rigor and discipline made him a self-professed expositor 
with the position that the most significant philosophic contribution should begin with a focus study on a specific intellectual. In the essay, Contemporary Filipino Philosophy, we find him attributing this choice, that is, professional preference as structured by one's formative years. After all, one cannot fault a scholar for his professional preferences inasmuch as therein rests the best of his potentials. Inasmuch as philosophy accommodates many methodologies and systems, and so one cannot easily judge the philosophical merit of one's project or intention, and for that one can only be measured by one's commitment to excellence. Before we get on with his position in the status of Filipino philosophy, it is important to note that Abulat wrote his first essay on the theme through a book review of Quito's works, Kasaysayan ng Filosofia and Ang Filosofia sa Diwang Pilipino. These reviews are published in De La Salle Sofia in the 1974-1975 issues, and what followed are essays published up to December 2019 in Critique. These papers delivered in seminary conferences in 2010 and 2017. Finding the range of these years, let us realize how Abulad seriously entertained this question on Filipino philosophy for almost five decades. And if one is aware of his insistence that the status of a Filipino philosophy is out of the question, it is not difficult to sympathize for each time he had to repeat his argument during philosophical conferences again and again for almost half a century. Nevertheless, each repetition entailed a new frame that can make us look for shades of transition. In Demeterius' work, he identified how Abulad schematized the evolution of Filipino philosophy into four phases. The first colonial phase, which was unprecedented lithomistic. The second colonial phase, where there have been influx of contemporary philosophies brought home by Filipino scholars who studied overseas. The third phase, which is that of early indigenization, as Filipino academicians started to reflect upon the existence and progress of Filipino philosophy. And fourth would be the beginning of late indigenization, where there have been critical takes on the earlier presumptions of a Filipino philosophy underlying in our culture. Demeterio sharply notes how Abulad pegged each phase as though it prompted by an effort of Quito, from her training in UST, homecoming from Freeburg, the publication of Pilosopia sa Diwang Filipino, and her letter reflections. To enrich and supply a counterpart to this historical construct, I therefore would like to contribute in that developing area where Abulad should be read as Abulad and not just as a reviewer of and collaborator to Quito. And for that, I'd like to present three important phases that may describe his evolved positions on the status of Filipino philosophy. First is his critique of the indigenous descriptions of the Filipino mind. Second is the philosophical value of EDSA 1986. And third is the emergence of postmodernity in the local philosophical landscape. But of course, Abulad cannot really be detached from the Emerita Quito. Impressed and deeply influenced by the grand woman of philosophy in the Philippines who liberated the students of his age from the monopoly of Somism, Abulad is aware that such recent awakening to a plethora of topics, proponents and systems have brought doing philosophy in the midst of human and social conditions. As early as 1976, Abulad is already aware of how philosophy is necessarily attached to life. As he said, Makabuluhan ang filosofiya. Hindi totoong ito ay pag-aari lamang ng ilang dalubhasang mahilig magparangya ng kanilang kaalaman sa loob ng apat na sulok ng silid-aralan. Ang filosofiyang hindi nagbibigay kahulugan sa buhay ay hindi kailaman natin maaaring tawaging tunay na filosofiya. Ang filosofiya ang nagiging tagataguyod sa buhay ng mga tao, maging ang buhay na ito ay pansarili, panlipunan o pangkalahatan. But since Abulad strongly believes that such must be done in the premise of disciplined research, he thought that the influence of philosophy is not that strong to the Filipinos as we have not yet developed a local vocabulary for our discipline. To me, this might be his first instruction, to attempt doing philosophy in the vernacular in Filipino language so that the discourse can be shared and the proper disposition to think can be known to all. This might be in his mind when he collaborated with Dr. Quito in writing the renowned local encyclopedia of philosophy. 
It is perhaps natural for Abulad to grope for a sufficient description of the Filipino mind at this early time. And in some of his essays, he admitted his bluntness when telling time and again that doing philosophy does not immediately require a nationalization of thought as the Greek philosophers did not call their work Greek philosophy, but have reached Roman lands anyway. And if so, such task is a long-term shot because the Filipino identity is yet to be disengaged from its colonial roots. For a sampler, we may find him write, writing, nay, ranting in a 1986 essay. Ang Filipino ay isang taong walang kasaysayan. Higit sa rito, ang tinatawag niyang kasaysayan ay pag-aari ng iba. Kasasay kasaysayang kolonyal, kasaysayan ng mga Espanyol, ng mga Amerikano, ng mga Hapones. Kasaysayan din ba ito ng mga Pilipino? He has been saying this even in earlier works as though we have been groping on sources and ways to understand our own consciousness. I think it is in such historical uncertainty where Abula is critical to the indigenization of philosophy. Another is its tendency to resort to translation to foreign works, to the vernacular which would come from an earlier layer of translation anyway or to anthropology which falls short of the philosophical intent of finding what could be some, so, some sort of a Hegelian spirit. If one is to use anthropology as Claude Lévi-Strauss did, philosophy can provide depth but would not be conscious of itself yet, conscious only of the fact that it is trying to break as profoundly as possible the, and the anthropological details. The effort will be laborious and at times would need the credibility of real anthropologists. Now, for Abulad, philosophical conclusions should not be rushed from second level translations and anthropological sources, as anthropology needs philosophy if it is to show any amount of rigorous discipline and insight. But all this should not be construed as meaning that philosophers can dabble in anthropology as well as anthropologists themselves. That the combination is profound, but its masterpiece is yet to be written by a Filipino philosopher. In all fairness, he gave due credits, but also criticized his peers who took on this indigenization efforts, leaving each of them a note that he is waiting for what else they can offer. With his quest for a credible historical reference and moral force to find the Filipino identity, we can nonetheless find in Abulad motivating notes to at least clear the road. In short essays in between 1970s to early 1980s, we find him ranting about the existence of moral abyss and the need for the Filipino to find oneself by at least having a deeper view, a uh, deeper view of fulfillment, happiness, freedom, and justice. In mga puna tungo sa pag-asa, he sounded like Marcel who lamented about the broken world as he said, "Wala nang aba." Wala na nga ba tayong tiyak na sarili? Hindi nga ba natin watas ang landas at bukas na ating, bukas na ating tinatahak? Dahop nga ba, that's nga ba, that's because of autocorrect, sorry. Dahop nga ba tayo sa pag-unawa ng kabuuan ng ating pagkakatao at pagkabansa? Ano nga ba ang Pilipino at ano ang Pilipinas? Ano talaga ang minanais natin para sa ating mabansa? Ganito na lang ba tayo? Bakit nga ba ganito? Abu did have seen hopes in 1984 to 1986 through the tarmac and at EDSA. As early as Ninoy's assassination, which he said came as a jolt, he knew that something more was in store. He admitted some change of that is a more optimistic stand towards the possibility of a Filipino philosophy. In contemporary Filipino philosophy, which was published post EDSA, he said, the EDSA revolution of February 1986 was a monumental achievement and it was to my mind an unmistakable sign of the Filipinas' potential for great things. A possible deep expression of the Filipino spirit but perhaps it is not Hegelian enough. But emerging there was hesitation, but emerging there was hesitation yet eventually he was able to take a clear stand. The Elsa Revolution was a product of some 400 years of our gradual evolution from consciousness to self-consciousness. It was a spiritual monument constructed through all those years of debasement as we have suffered silently our life in bondage that for him, his liberty from the dictator is a new lease in life where non-history, where from non-history we move to history of which spirit manifests in arts, 
literature, culture, and the mind. While he cited from Kant, Hegel, Schelling, and Orientalism, Abulad claims that this more optimistic take is coming not from a single philosophical framework, but as a true universal consciousness that veers away from the petty fights of partisan philosophizing, thereby engendering a new life. As a new way of thinking, a manner of society that has not yet been tried. While these are dreamy projections on what a new philo a Filipino society would be, he quipped that the philosopher must always dream. But waking up from the dream once again, he insists the requirement of scholarship. He remains firm in thinking that Filipino philosophy will gain recognition of the national status by going beyond our scholarly foundations that we should now start making giants of ourselves. For a bulad, Philippine philosophy have come to age to pursue anything in the name of excellence. And so post-EDSA, the, stan the standard of excellence is put on the table, affirming the many possibilities of a Filipino doing philosophy can pursue. This position preempts the, name, the next theme that Abulad will cover in his philosophical career, which is postmodernity. Abulad have created an almost structured account in postmodernity, and so we have to cover his fundamental positions. For him, this is not simply a school of thought, but a perspective which reveals the contemporary situation. It is after modern, which is not a historical transition, but the split from the anthropocentrism of the Cartesian ego where narratives and meaning take over the thinker. It's via negativa prompted the post-human of which overhaul engenders a cleansing, a starting over, a detox, if you'd like to call it, rebuilding which optimistically affirms the humane. For, from the philosophical hero of the Edsa phase, which was Hegel, Abulad's postmodern echoes Nietzsche, that for Abulad, Nietzsche is the initiator of the negativistic consciousness that most of us are scared of, but can ironically easily get away with. As the first thing to remember about postmodernity, that is its initial essential component, which is the negative, or if you will, destructive, or more benignly, deconstructive. The invitation is, before anything else, to abolish everything, which is probably summarized by his daunting command when we were students in college. Let go. Ev let everything go. Echoing Nietzsche, Abulad finds premium in the via negativa for finding the sole path to the positive, which is the task of cleansing to be a child again. True enough, nothing will be new and everything will just occur in vicious and stagnant routines if we are going to act like stern, stubborn adults. The via positiva raises a desecration and demosologizing where there is enough space to make adjustments and create new spaces on account of changing times. The second phase of the dialectic, I believe, is postmodern's redeeming grace, or if I may call, the saving parachute from useless rhetorical returns. That without the via positiva of most modernity, no genesis of a new philosophical age is possible, and the ongoing quest for philosophy is impossible. And of course, Kant. Thus, the postmodern project is a recreation of this profound sense of freedom and creativity, that makes man neither wobbly in perfection of fact, a perception of facts, nor deceitful in having gone through all thinkable adversities. The postmodern attitude for Abula is grounded in truths that respect the outcomes of all beginnings, be it from East or West, ancient or new, right or left, good or evil, as we have already moved on from these dichotomies. In a certain sense, postmodernism reprises pure reason self-criticism. That this dialogical shift then furthers results in a consciousness that is integral, holistic, global, dynamic, and evolutionary, thereby affirming and being more inclusive to many other possible narratives on Filipino philosophy. And so we have come to the last part, which is some sort of a reading session. It can be observed that whenever a bullet grapples with something, that is uncertain and what can only be estimated, he performs a prudent process by resorting to scholarship and a critical reflection of the current situation and regards Filipino philosophy. Abulad, when asked, would perform the same. While his last published essay on Filipino philosophy was a posthumous release in December of 2019, his position in a 1988 essay, Contemporary Filipino Philosophy, remains consistent and it is as though it is written for our time. So I'm going to take the task to read like a bullet here. And there is the rub. 
What will deserve the name of Filipino philosophy as we see it will eventually be comprised of our written philosophy. To be fair, there is and there has always been a Filipino philosophy, if only because no people are known to survive without an implied metaphysics. But such a philosophy which springs from people's natural disposition is not sufficient to establish the worth of a nation. There is also a need for a more consciously developed system of thought, one that results from the deliberate sifting of ideas in a thinker's mind. In other words, the demand is for written philosophy. Writing gives our ideas their permanence and as such expose our intellectual strengths and weaknesses before a competent audience. Our books lay our souls open for scrutiny and there is no escaping the judgment of all. Publication exposes not only our merits but also our pitfalls. History will decide if we have made a contribution not only to Filipino philosophy but to world philosophy as well. This brings us to another point. If our philosophy is to make a dent in history, it must pass the test of time. And only greatness weathers the storm and stress of the cunning mind. Our country, I dare say, is a nation in search of a great tradition. Deprived of this great tradition, culture is an empty word, and the absence of culture makes of history a misnomer. It is thus not without the reason that I posed this question at the beginning of the paper, where are our monuments? Even the gains of Edsa will wither away if we do not follow them up with the serious works of genius. I regret the persistence of the dangerous political bickerings as well, as the scandalous stubbornness of the forces of corruption plaguing our country, for this do not help any in our effort at nation building. They merely drag us back to the mire of mediocrity and block the way to spiritual renewal. History is the march of the spirit towards the peaks of freedom and liberty. Philosophy dies with the death of reflection, and reflection suffocates whether where matter so thickens that the spirit is unable to liberate itself sufficiently. There is in the air too much political brandishing which draws our attention away from the real task of the day, and this deflection of the spirit takes on a serious man, deceiving us into believing that we are dealing with authentic concerns. The truth of the matter is that our current preoccupations have made us lose sight of our real calling, that instead of starting to break the ground upon which to construct our spiritual monuments, we continue in our evasive meanderings. The spirit remains in the dark and with it culture and history. Philosophy continues to grope in uncertainty. What then is the challenge of contemporary Filipino philosophy? My answer is simple. To so keep on going, to resist the temptation of slithering back to the ways of idleness and mediocrity, to develop the stalwart spirit that dares to think beyond the scope of the popular conception, in one word, to philosophize. To philosophize until our children will finally see the day and when they can proudly proclaim to the world that here at last is our Filipino philosophy. Such a daunting task, a very big challenge for the younger ones, for the Xennials, for the millennials, what one could but imagine whether Rome is postmodernized saying, yes, you can do it. Thank you very much. Sorry. Thank you very much. So uh, we move on to the question and answer. I will read the questions and the speakers will then answer your questions. Okay, first question. Tanong para kay Dr. Kalano, sir. Ang pagsasalin ay pwedeng pagdadagdag o pagbabawas ng katotohanan. Di ang mangyayari, puro na kanya-kanyang paliwanag at wala ng totoo. Sir? Uh, hindi ko sinabi na 
nadadagdagan o nababawasan ang ati ang katotohanan no uh, kundi magiging relativismo yan uh, yung totoo ay totoo kaya nang sinabi ko kanina kahit ano pa man ito ngunit yung pagbigkas natin ng totoo yon nagkakaroon tayo ng pagkakaiba-iba no uh, depende yan sa paglapit o kaya naman uh, kung gaano ka kalapit sa totoo di ba o kung gaano ka kalayo sa totoo Uh, doon magkakaroon ng pag, pagkakaiba-iba. So, uh, kung sasagutin ko yung tanong ng mabilisan, uh, hindi na hindi na babawasan o nadagdag, nadadagdagan ang totoo. No? Uh, ang totoo ay totoo. Uh, ngunit yung pagbigkas natin sa totoo, yon maaaring maging totoo o hindi. So, yun po ang aking sagot, Ma'am Glow. Okay, maraming salamat po, Sir. So, may tanong po ulit. From Sumascan Father Seminary, ito po yung tutun- susunod na tanong. Mas mainam po ba nagamitin ang wikang Filipino sa pag-aaral ng pilosopiya? Yung mga salin gaya ng kay Tomas Rosario kaysa sa banyagang wika gaya ng Ingles. Para kay Sir Mark. Mm. Sa tingin ko, uh... Hin- maganda kung maaari nating pag-aralan ng pilosopiya uh, sa wikang Filipino. Laging bahagi yan ng buong retorika at pagtatanong ni Padre Roque, no? bakit kailangan Ingles ang maging batayan sa ating pag-unawa ng mga konseptong filosofikal? Uh, bakit hindi maaaring maging Filipino? Di ba? Lagi niyang tinatanong yan, yung tanong niya, ano ang sangkalan? At pag sinabi mo, chopping board, sasabihin niya hindi, mali yan. Di ba? Uh, isa yung uh, maaring kahoy na kung saan hinihiwa ang mga gulay. Ganon. Sasabihin mo sa akin, chopping board. O nga, chopping board, sir. Pero sabi ni Padre Roque, hindi yan chopping board. Sangkalan yan. Uh, sa tingin ko, merong isang uri ng paglapit sa totoo Uh, na maaaring bigkasin ng wikang Filipino at na maaaring matauhan tayo sa punto de vista nating mga nagsasalitang uh, ng Filipino o ng Ilocano o ng Cebuano, uh, isang pagdanas ng totoo na konkreto na maaaring malayo sa atin kapag wikang, wikang banyaga ang ating batayan. Di ba? uh, tulad ng halimbawa, uh, may mga konsepto na paaring wala tayong tunay na pagdanas nito tulad ng nyebe halimbawa di ba uh, wala namang nyebe dito uh, iniisip lang natin ah siguro yung nyebe para yun yung nandoon sa refrigerator bubuksan ko hawakan ko yon nyebe yon uh, at tuwang-tuwa tayo sa pag-uunawang alam natin kung ano yung nyebe pero hindi ganun ang nyebe di ba uh, merong pagdanas sa realidad na maaring hindi natin makuha uh, kapag uh, ang gamit nating wika ay banyaga sa atin. Ngayon, ibig, hindi ko naman sinasabi na dapat Filipino lang. No? Uh, napakalimitado ng pag-uunawang yun. Uh, tanggap rin natin naman no? na meron din namang katotohanang maaring ituro sa atin yung ibang wika at sa ganyang pamamaraan uh, ay dapat maging bukas din tayo sa pagkatuto gamit nila o gamit ng mga ibang wika. Uh, at sa pan- pag-uunawang yan, no, uh, nakikita natin yung mga uh, katotohanan na maaaring hindi natin madanas gamit yung sarili nating wika o kakayahan na maaari din namang maipadanas sa atin ng ibang wika. At uh, uh, dati, no, Uh, tuwang-tuwa ako na yung semina- sa seminaryo ay maaaring ituro ang pilosopiya sa wikang Filipino sapagkat silang lahat ay Pilipino. Pero ngayon na uh, ang pilosopiya ay ang, ang konteksto ng seminaryo sa Pilipinas ay nagbubukas na rin para sa mga uh, uh, Vietnamese, sa mga East Timorese at iba pang mga banyagang estudyante. Uh, kinakailangan ding unawain na ang totoo ay hindi lamang maaring bigkasin gamit ang ating wika, kundi gamit rin ng isang wikang maaari ring unawain ng iba. No? At sa ganyang pagtatalaban, uh, lumalawig din kung ano yung pagkaunawa natin ng totoo at pagdanas natin ng totoo. 
kaya kung tatanungin ako kung maari na bigkasin ang ang pilosopiya gamit ang wikang Pilipino sana maganda yon uh, ngunit sana uh, hindi rin nito isara ang ating pag-uunawa sa katotohanan ng maari pang idulot din ng ibang wika o ibang pamamaraan ng pagbigkas ng toto. So, yun okay, maraming salamat, sir. May mga tanong pa po. So, wow, wow. for Dr. Scalano and Dr. Strebel, may nakikita po akong connection sa ulat nila. Ang pamimilosopiyang Pilipino ba ay naayon sa kakayahan ng isang tao dahil sa sarili niyang pagsasalin, pag pagdadagdag at pagbawas at pagdadagdag at pagbawas. Yun po. Sir PJ, ikaw naman kasi kanina pa ako sumasagot. <laughs> yes, sir. Sir PJ. Hello. Salamat uh, ng Globe. Salamat. Sir Mark, tingin ko nga, ano, tama yung ibinigay na, na una. Kasi kung ang punto tungkol sa pamilosopia sa wikang Filipino ay kinakabit ito sa aktual na karanasan. Doon sa ginawa ko kanina na doxografia, nais kong ipakita nga na pamilosopia ay nakakabit pa din sa aktual na karanasan. Kaya nga, hindi natin din matatakasan na bahagi ng karanasan yung wika. Ano na kung paano ko danasin yung daigdig sa pamamagitan at kuminsan pa yata hindi rin bagay sabihin yung pamamagitan kasi parang instrumento lang yun eh. Ano? Pero nga na yung mismong wika ay yung actual din karanasan. Ano? Na walang karanasan kung walang wika. Sigurado ako na isang buong kurso yun no, sa pilosofiya ng wika. At hindi naman sa dahil yung tao mismo. No? Na, kasi nabasa ko din yung uh, kagitong din na katanungan ano? na na ano to? na sinisipi naman si Protagoras na ibig sabihin ba na ito na yung tao ang siyang sukatan ng lahat? Hindi rin. Kasi nga, hindi naman sa, siguro kung koliktado rin sa naitanong kanina, no, kay Dr. Calano, na ibig sabihin ba niya na yung nagsasalin, pwede niyang sabihin ng kahit anong gusto niyang sabihin. Koliktado din yun, ano, na yung daigdig ay hindi mo naman pwedeng manipulahin. Katulad ng yung teksto na sinasalin mo, hindi mo pwedeng manipulahin. At tingin ko nga, yung lumilitaw din talagang punto ay yung katapatan mo sa aktual na nagpapakita sa iyo. Muli, babalik na naman tayo sa punto ng fenomenolohiya na walang pagpapanggap, walang pag-iisip na kaya nating malaman yung hindi natin kayang malaman, manatili lamang sa binibigay ng karanasan. Hindi sa sinasabi na yung binibigay lang ng karanasan, yun na yung buong katotohanan. Pero inaamin lang no, na ito yung talagang nararanasan ko, ito yung talagang nangyayari sa akin. Ito yung talagang pinagdadaanan ko. No, at kung maaari pang magdagdag, ano, kanina nga, ano, kasi nga, uh, mukhang nabanggit ko yata din sa aking bio note, ano, na ako'y uh, may asawa dalawang anak at tinatanong ako kanina ng misis ko nung kami kumakain, paano kaya yan ano, na nasa YouTube ka mamaya, baka mag-ingay yung dalawang bata. Sabi ko, sige, sabihin lang natin na meron na lalabas ako at uh, lalabas ako sa YouTube yan yan at tumahimik muna sila pero kung di talaga makakaya aminin ko yun yung konteksto ko eh, no? nasa bahay ako wala ako sa opisina ito yung sitwasyon nating lahat na may pandemya kaya itong mga ganito mga konferensya ay nagaganap sa ganitong paraan ano kaya kung may batang sumisigaw sa likod di ba aaminin mo yun yung talagang nangyayari no? pero salamat sa Diyos at mukhang hindi pa yata umiistorbo ang uh, mga anak ko no na yes at uh, at dose at sa sad no Uh, kaya laking pasalamat din doon. Pero yung punto ko lang, ano yung punto ko lang ay na yung, yung filosofiya hindi hiwalay sa karanasan. At yung nagsasalin, mayroon siyang pananagutan na maging tapat doon sa teksto, maging tapat doon sa sinasabi, at yung nagpe-phenomenolohiya uh, at nag-uusap tungkol sa kasaysayan, sa konteksto naman ni uh, uh, Dr. Reyes, tapat-tapat siya din doon sa aktual talagang naranasan at nakikita. Papasok ko naman kay Dr. Calano. Baka masyado na rin ako maraming nga sa atin. Okay, Sir Mark. Okay na yun. <laughs> <laughs> sa tingin ko, na, 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 natamaan na ni Sir PJ lahat ng kailangang tugunan tungkol sa tanong na yun. Uh... Okay po, ito po. Katanungan from Kolehyo de Dagupan para po kay Dr. Altes Albela. What was doctor's Abulad? What was Dr. Abulad's latest stand on Duterte? Wow. 
I remember at the start, he tended to support Duterte, as we discussed Heidegger, as someone who challenged the usual politics. Yes, ma'am? Kilala ko yung nagtanong. Maraming salamat sa katanungan, Marcus. Anong face ka dyan? Um, palagay ko, kung nakalagay na sa tanong mo na narinig mo na yung opinion niya patungkol dyan sa inyong klase, you have to take it as it is. Uh, ang trabaho ko ngayon dito ay ang ipakita ang kanyang pananaw tungkol sa development ng Filipino philosophy uh, na magre-reflect din sa sitwasyon natin. Kaya kung makikita mo, medyo na-incorporate din yung historical mode na nagbigay ng transition sa kanyang position sa kanyang mga position sa pagbuo ng pilosopiyang Pilipino ano pero so usapin patungkol kay presidente Duterte dahil uh, wala pa akong nakikita na um, thread o nakikita na tawag dito na pwedeng sequence na pwedeng isulat patungkol diyan uh, iiiwan ko sa iyo ang katanungan ibabato ko uli sa iyo ang katanungan dahil malamang kung ano yung narinig mo Iba pa dun sa narinig ko. Isa sa mga tinuro sa akin ni Dr. Abulan simula ng kolehiyo ay ang scholarly prudence. Kaya uh, sabi ko nga kanina sa uh, aking introduction na I don't want to put words in his mouth. Okay, so kung ano yung narinig mo at kung ano yung narinig ko uh, at maaring hindi tugma yun, hindi ko rin na alam kung ano yung nangyari sa inyong Heidegger, Heidegger class, di ba? Palagay uh, ko, we have to take them as they are respectively. Ayon. Salamat po. Salamat, ma'am. So, may katanungan pa po. Ayan. Another one to Dr. Albella. So, to Dr. Albella, is my understanding correct po ba na dahil di lumalago ang pamimilosopiya sa Pilipinas ay sa kadahilan ng masyado tayong tutok sa mga negatibo at etiistikong pilosopiya? Ma'am. Maraming salamat sa katanungan, Harvey. Uh, palagay ko, uh, may kagandahan at may di kagandahan ang pagtutok sa isang perspektibo lamang sa pilosopiya. No? At uh, hindi ko nakikita sa proyekto ni Dr. Abulad uh, sa kanyang personal na pilosopakal na proyekto at saka sa kanyang proyekto patungkol sa kung mayroon nga bang Filipino philosophy, yung pagtutok lamang sa itiismo. Okay? Pero... Uh, nakikita ko yung nakikita niyang kagandahan at kasamaan. Ang kagandahan ay bilang isang scholar ng pilosopiya makakabuo ka ng kredibilidad na maaaring yun na ang magiging ambag mo sa development o sa, pag, uh, sa pag-andar ng pilosopiyang Pilipino. Pero may kasamaan din naman ang pagtutok dahil yung, kung yun lang ang alam mo maaaring matigil ang punto ng kasaysayan ng pilosopiya doon at lalo na sa ating bansa na emergent pa lang ang Filipino philosophy. So, uh, focus is good and bad at the same time. We have to put it in proper perspective. So, and uh, it is a challenge to do in developing philosophic scholarship. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Maraming salamat po. Para po kay Doc Mark, ano po ang masasabi nyo sa isinulay ng paham guro sa Filipino na si Efren Abweg na ang pagsasalin ay isang pagtataksil. Ako. Sir. Uh, interesante yung uh, yung uh, katagang yan na ang pagsasalin ay pagtataksil sapagkat nga naman no, ang pagsasalin ay pag-unawa sa original na teksto Uh, gamit ang ibang wika. Uh, pag, uh, sa makatwid, isa siyang pagtalikod sa uh, unang pagbigkas. Uh, kaya't sa tingin ko sa ganyang palagay, isa siyang uri ng pagtataksil. Ngunit isa rin siyang pamamaraan na kung saan may aring intindihin na pinapalawig yung pag-uunawa sa isang kataga sa pamamagitan rin ng uh, pagsasalin. No? Uh, gaya nga nang sabi ko, Uh, tayong lahat na nag-aral ng pilosopiya at nag-aaral pa ng pilosopiya ay, ay sinasalinan lamang ng kaalaman, no? isang uri ng pagsasalin. Uh, wala naman sa atin dito ang 
talagang lubusang nag-aral kay Platon o Aristoteles sa Griego. Uh, wala naman sa atin nag-aral kay San Agustin o Anselmo o kaya Santo Tomas na Latin o kaya ni, ni Descartes sa Latin din si Descartes uh, si, si, si Hume uh, in, 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 English o kaya si Marx na Aleman o ganon I mean, o kaya si Lao Zee, o kaya si, si Kong Zee, hindi rin naman natin sila binasa gamit yung original nilang wikang uh, sino na, na maaring hindi Mandarin uh, o Cantonese uh, pero ang sinasabi ko, kung titignan mo Ibig bang sabihin yan na ang buong gawain ng filosofiya ay isang uri ng pagtataksil? Uh, maari ba natin siyang tignan ganon? Hindi ko inilahad ang, ang pagsasalin bilang isang uri ng pagtataksil. Ngunit ipinakita ko na ito yung isang uh, pagpapasa, isang pagpapalawig ng wika at sabay rin naman pagbabawas, pagdadagdag at pagbabawas. Uh, Hindi man tayo natutuwa sa konsepto ng dagdag bawas kapag may eleksyon. Ngunit uh, sa bawat uh, pagsasalin ay doon natin nakikita yung pag-usad ng kaalaman. No? Lumalawik na dadagdagan yung pagdikas sa mga kaisipan ng mga palaisip o pilosopo o ang pagdanas natin ng totoo. Ngunit hindi rin natin talagang lubusang na idadala o na, na ikukuha yung kabuan ng kanyang uh, pinag-iisipan. Di ba? laging bahagya lamang no ngunit kahit na bahagya lamang makikita mo rin na meron pa uh, sa tingin ko mas magandang unawain ang pagsasalin bilang ganyan kaysa isang uri ng pagtataksil no habang sabay rin namang inuunawa uh, yung konsepto kung bakit sinasabi nilang kataksilan na uh, gumamit ng pagsasalin di ba uh, Sa mga batang nag-aaral ng pilosopiya, hindi natin masyadong hinihingi yon yung pagbasa at kakayang magbasa ng mga original na teksto. Ngunit uh, sa pag-akyat mo, sa yung sariling uh, kadalubhasaan, uh, dumarating tayo sa punto na kinakailangan sana may kakayahang ka magbasa ng mga original na teksto. Uh, hindi man ng lubusan, ngunit yung matikman man lamang o yung yung makapasok ka man lang sa punto de vista nung binabasa mong palaisip no uh, si Sir PJ halimbawa ay uh, trabaho niya ay kay Nietzsche at uh, well Strebel nga ang apelyido niya so may aleman talaga ang kanyang may pagka aleman aleman talaga yung kanyang wika at well aleman yung kanyang lineage pero pati yung wika ng kanyang pinag-aralan ay aleman para man lang makapasok man lang sa mundo ni Nietzsche at subukan man lang bigkasin yung mga salita gamit yung wika ni Nietzsche di ba may may kakaibang karanasan doon sa tingin ko na kailangan meron din yung mga nagdadalubhasa pero pero wag sana tayong makulong lamang sa laro ng wika di ba kasi yung laro ng wika uh, panlabas pa rin yan no uh, sa huli uh, Ang gawain, sabi nga, sabi nga ni Sir PJ, sa, sa huli, no, yung gawain ng taong namimilosopiya ay yung pagdanas sa totoo. No? Talagang to, to, it's a way of life. No? Isa siyang pamamara ng pamumuhay. Isang pagbigkas sa totoo. Pero hindi lang to pagbigkas, hindi lang to pagdanas, kundi pamumuhay ng totoo. At sa tingin ko, uh, doon natin maaaring uh, tignan yung gawain ng taong namimilosopiya. Diba? Uh, hindi ko kinokontra si Dr. Abulad na sinabi niyang dapat nakasulat. No? Sa huli, pinag-uusapan natin sila dahil sa mga naisulat nila. No? Uh, at, at sa ayaw natin sa hindi, no? uh, napaka, napaka moderno noong konseptong iyan na dapat may nasulat. Uh, habang wala naman talagang isinulat si Lao Zee o si Kong Zee o wala namang isinulat si Socrates. Uh, Pero nariyan na tayo. No? Uh, patuloy na pagsasalin, patuloy na, na pagpapasa-pasa ng kaalaman, nabubuo yung pamayan ng umuunawa at dumadana sa mundo gamit ang isang punto de vista. At sa tingin ko, mahalaga yun. Uh, sa tingin ko, mas mahalaga yun. 
yung sa huli, yung pagbigkas kung ano ba yung pilosopiyang Pilipino, uh, sa tingin ko, gaya ng sinasabi parati ni Padre Roque, uh, susunod yun. Susunod yun. Uh, at, at mas maganda munang danasin ang totoo, bigkasin ang totoo, uh, at hayaan. Hayaan ng mga bagay-bagay na malaglag sa kanilang kinalalagyan. So, ganun po ang aking pag-unawa uh, sa tanong na yon ni Sir Alex. Salamat po. Maraming salamat, Sir, sa iyong komprehensibong pagpapaliwanag. Ayun, so, ang pagsasalin ay pagtataksil, ngunit hindi rin. Okay. So, unfortunately, we're down to the last two, two questions kasi po we're limited by time. Now, this question is for Dr. Estrebel from Santo Tomas Academy. So, sir, given the diversity of cultures, dialects, traditions, and belief, do you think it is possible to arrive at a common Filipino existential philosophy? Sir, take the floor. Thank you. That's another complicated question. But I'd like to say that it's possible for us to understand Zoran Kierkegaard without being Danish. It's possible for us to understand Martin Heidegger without being a German. And uh, there is a sense in me that when you say existential philosophy, it goes beyond culture. It goes beyond, there's something that is truly human. When we talk about angst, when we talk about facticity, these are things that are not particular to any culture. And thus, we might, we will have to say that, well, I'll have to categorically say that there will be something um, problematic about building a Filipino existential philosophy. Because existentialism, um, well, that can even be defined, you know, starts take on what existentialism is would be different from some others. You know, when Sartre says this, uh, I'm, I'm only talking about Sartre because I believe um, Sartre is but one of the few who really would call himself an existentialist. Uh, the others are simply bracketed uh, together um, with him, but somehow they disagree on many other points. And so on the one hand, there is that point that, that when you say existentialism, it goes beyond culture, what is really primordially human Okay, but at the same time, even existentialists would disagree with one another, not in the cultural sense, but perhaps in the, even in the personal sense. And if I would refer back to Hellenistic philosophy, that's one big difference, I guess, between Hellenistic philosophers and existentialists or Marxists or whatever. The, the Hellenistic philosophers, you could call them card-carrying Stoics, card-carrying Epicureans. They really swear by uh, Diogenes Sinope or they really swear by uh, by uh, Zeno of uh, Citium. But when you say existentialism, especially in the 20th century up, up to now, it's a wide array. It's uh, perhaps, uh, if you may borrow from uh, Wittgenstein, it's a family resemblance. There's not one thing that would keep them all together and say that's your just one definition of being an existentialist. And so my, my, real, well, my real answer to the question is that though we might disagree on certain things and there are so many levels to that not just cultural but also personal and so on the point of existentialist philosophy is still grounded on what is primordially human and somehow could be on the one hand prior to culture but also beyond culture i don't know if that makes any sense thank you, thank you sir salamat po so down to our last question na po. So for all the other questions that you have, our speakers po will try to answer them in your in the private room. So pasensya na po because we are limited by time. Now from Prince Eric Gapo. Ito po ay tanong para kay Doc Albela. Ang hinahanap po ba ni Brother Abulad ay isang siyentipikong pamamaraan sa pamimilosopiya o naniniwala po ba siya na mayroong pilosopiyang may hahango sa oh, is Volkgeist ng mga Pilipino? 
Vâng. Yun. Um, maraming salamat muli sa tanong, no? Kung nabasa mo na yung interview ni Dr. De Leon kay Brother Abulad, dun i reveal ni Brother Romy na siya'y nanggaling sa College of Science. Na bago siya tumalun sa pulisya after the seminary at nag-USTAB, uh, pumasok muna siya sa UST College of Science sa kagustuhang maging doktor. Kaya hindi magiging surprising kung medyo scientific yung attitude niya sa pagsusulat, sa pag-aargumento, at sa pagpili kay Emmanuel Kant bilang filosofo. So, sa tanong na kung mahalaga ba ang agham o science, ang pagiging scientific, ang malino na sagot doon ay oo. May mga bakas ng pagpapahalaga niya. Pangalawa, kung may mahahango ba mula sa folk guys ng mga Pilipino, siguro kaya naging nahihirapan si Brother Romy sa pagsagot patungkol sa kondisyon ng Filipino philosophy ay may alam siya na kumukulo sa ilalim na pwedeng lumabas anytime dahil laging challenge or laging hinahamon ang mga Pilipino ng kasaysayan. So, uh, bago mag-edsa yung mga maiikli niyang mga sinulat patungkol sa Pilipino ay parang aninag ng kaguluhan ng panahong yon na parang napakahirap maghanap ng Filipino identity na nagpap, ng pagkakakilala ng Pilipino dahil ang kasaysayan natin ay nanggaling sa kolonyal at yung kinatatayuan yung sitwasyon nun ay panahon pa ng martial law. Kaya alam mo yun, uh, walang kalayaan, uh, puto lahat. Uh, hindi malayang mag-isip ng hanggang sa kaduluduluhan, kumbaga. At nakakita siya ng bagong pag-asa noong 1986. Actually, mula noong 1984, mula sa tarmac hanggang sa EDSA. So, yun ay yung mga areas na um, by snippets niya lang sinasabi sa kanyang mga mas organisadong essays patungkol sa Pilipiyang Pilipino. No? Pero palagay ko, kailangan natin ding tingnan ito dahil may nakikita tayo na struggle doon sa paghahanap na hindi naman siguro siya dadaldal on that for 50 years na paulit-ulit at magsasaga na sasagot sa mga seminars na mga undergrads usually patungkol sa Filipino philosophy. Kaya kahit alam niya na, na ang sagot niya ay it's out of the question, he would not spend time for that or on that kung wala siyang nakikita na pwedeng makuha sa pagmumulat ng Pilipino sa ating buhay, sa ating kasaysayan, yung mga expressions ng spirit, kumbaga. So, Palagay ko mahalaga pareho sa pagbuo ng um, in drafting uh, what could be called Filipino philosophy. Pero ito yung catch. Sa bawat attempt, ang gusto niya lang naman ay yung scholarly rigor. Uh, nakakita na siya ng mga scholars na nakapag-contribute doon pero karamihan ay bitin. One thing, hindi niya babanggitin ng mga scholars na to kung wala siyang nakitang tama. Sa totoo lang. Pero... Laging merong critical attitude dahil nga bahagi ito ng kanyang philosophical rigor at ng kanyang scholarly demands na kailangan nating intindihin dahil nanggaling siya sa tradisyon ng filosofiya na napaka-mainstream, okay? uh, na napaka-rigorous, ganyan. Pero at the same time, uh, bukas siya sa mga bagong dimension o sa mga bagong narratives dahil lang sa impluensya din ng postmodernity ng kanyang sariling proyekto sa postmodernity para makita kung ano pa yung pwede nating i-contribute. So, nung nawala siya, sa atin naiwan ng pressure. Sa atin naiwan ng challenge kung paano natin itutuloy ang kwentong ito. Okay? Dahil tapos na yung 50 years niya, tayo nang susunod na magkikwento ng storya ng pilosopiyang Pilipino. So, yun. Maraming salamat po. Yun. Maraming salamat, ma'am. So, that ends our question and answer part. Maraming maraming salamat po sa lahat ng mga nagtanong. At maraming maraming salamat din po sa ating mga magagaling na speakers or tagapagsalita sa Panel 3. So, palakpakan po natin sila. Virtual clap. Okay.